Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Holy Comforter Episcopal Church Bible Study. It's great to see you. Uh, we are now on episode three of our First Corinthians study. Uh, tonight, we'll be talking about love and morality and uh, a little bit about sex also. Um, so it'll be fun. I'm scintillating, I'm sure. Um, it, are there any uh, reflections from last week? Any, anything that we talked about in worship, communion? Any questions? Talk a little bit about church attendance, which was sort of our precursor conversation. So let's go to small group reflections. Uh, and let's dive into the second question, because I think that's the best. Is right and wrong morally absolute, or can morality shift depending on culture and time period? Yeah, perfect example is... Uh some of the things that uh, corporate America has encountered where other countries will uh, participate in uh, bribery and mordida on government officials and it's not frowned on. But in the U.S. we have a uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Mm. And if U.S. companies and officers and their people get caught giving advice, they get that's a federal crime. Yeah. So yeah, and that's one of the things our corporate people gripe about because it's accepted in other parts of the world. Interesting. But we can't do it. Yeah. Clearly, so, he, he used there. to work for the Internal Revenue Service. Yeah. I remember the first yeah. time I met you, I was like, what do you used to do? He goes, I work for the federal government. I'm like, oh, what part? <laughs> IRS? <laughs> oh, yeah. you said Department of the Treasury? I was like, okay. And we don't yeah. share the same or something. <laughs> Just tease that out. No, I mean, whatever. That's okay. Like I said, I'm married to him, and I don't share his same views on yeah. that. No, no, no. But no, but, but I think you're right. I mean, even even culture to culture, mor morality is different. We, we sort of have different expectations of what the good is. And the ethics, ethics comes in with this, ethics. too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think about like slavery, right? I mean, slavery yeah. used to be like, slavery's a good. Um, it's moral to have slaves. And, it's a given. Right. Now it's it's um, very different. It's, it struck me that the founding fathers of this country, they were very religious, mm -hmm. but they had slaves. Yeah. They had slaves. It, you know, and, and this is this is a sort of an interesting thing. Um, you know, uh, all men are created equal. Or like, you know, it's interesting, I think, um, in their understanding, yes, y yeah. Till the push comes to shove, and then it's uh, you know it's okay for me. Right, and that be okay for you? Right. I mean, and, and really for them, men meant like white males who own property, <laughs> right? Yeah. And and so I personally, I think the entire history of America is us continuing to understand what this means. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so I think that's what, it, you know, every sort of social revolution we have is us going back to this, and figuring out, well, what does this word mean? And that's what, that's, I, to me, that's what American history boils down to. Colonization. Yeah. And yeah. I, I was a history major in college. So I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Have you had any experiences? I mean, you sort of talk about, you know, foreign businesses, any other sort of experiences with morality differing from place to place? I'm just sort of curious. Absolutely, 100%. I don't know, sometimes I think, um, oh, I don't know, we go around and supposedly we're showing, oh my goodness, politically. Oh, I heard one person say um, uh, compassion. Mm. And was it compassion? It just slipped my mind, but it hit me like a, do you mean compassion or do you mean condescension? Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the times here, we think we've evolved considerably, mm -hmm. but we're condescending more yeah. than we are doing anything yeah. else a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think just the age that people get married is a good example of culture, cultural variations. Yeah. You know, certainly in the United States now, people are getting married at an older and older and older age and opting to have children at an older and older <coughs> age. But if you look around the world, that's not the case. You know, it's not unusual in some cultures to see somebody who's 13 or 14 years old getting married. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and we would find that abhorrent. That would be abhorrent. Yeah, and for them, yeah. it's just yeah, mm -hmm. it's part of life. It's part of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and you know, clearly, we're going to be talking a little bit about sexuality. Also, you know, in many parts of the world, it's a man would have you know a wife, a mistress, and a girlfriend, mm -hmm. and, and just well, and we are like, whoa, no, not okay, but. Um, you know, it's just morality is different in different or places. Or multiple lives. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so um, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to see what word you all have. What word is this translated as? Okay, so uh, the first, just the first phrase. Uh, it is actually reported that there is. What, what do y'all have? Immortality. Yeah, sexual, sexual, sexual immortality. Sexual sin among you. Sexual sin. Oh, that's interesting. Anybody have fornication? No. Oh man, that's too bad. <laughs> Such a good word. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so uh, it's this word, porneia. We kind of sort of get the drift there. Um, it may be that we actually think that, that Paul is one of the, the first people to be using this word in, in a written sense. Um, so it's sort of interesting that we, we come across this word. I think it's it's really important that what we think of as sexual immorality may not necessarily be what ancient Christians thought of as sexual immorality. And I think this is part of what we're struggling with now is that we take what we think is sexually immoral and read it into the text. And I think we actually have to be listening to what is the text actually saying? What is Paul actually saying? So um, this usually just means any sort of uh, illicit sexual relationship or intercourse. It can mean adultery, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean adultery. It's, it's used in both senses. <coughs> um, and you can see on my outline, it can also be spiritualized. Um, a lot of times Paul talks about how the church is the bride of Christ, and that's the sort of sexual sort of marriage imagery. Um, and, and so when the church of the people of God start worshiping other gods, that can also be a sort of type of sexual immorality, a sort of infidelity. Um, and, and so that can also be sort of spiritualized. Thought just came to me. As I read the Bible, Yes, um, the history is important. The vocabulary that you use is important. Is it Greek? Is it? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. That's all important. And what we read into it, or for me, it's what applies mm -hmm. at this point in time. And it becomes very personal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just thought of that right now. No, oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and this is why... Um, we always talk about exegesis when we when uh, seminarians have to write papers. We have to write exegesis papers. This means to take the meaning out of. Um, what you don't want to do is, uh, I think it's an e eisegesis, Oops. and that's reading something into the text. So you always want to do exegesis. You let the text sort of be in its own cultural environment, its own historical setting. You you sort of let it speak to you, and then you apply it to your own culture, rather than taking what you think to be true and reading it to there. Oh, oh, just a question. Mm. 
the marriage ceremony, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that hadn't been the same down through the ages. Mm -hmm. uh, like in the past, like during Paul's time, mm -hmm. did they actually have marriage ceremonies where you would stand up with a priest and give your vows and say, you know, don't let any man tear this asunder? Uh, it, it was, it was, it, it was very, very different, um, and I can't. You can't describe it all, but we, yeah. we do know there were some sort of marriage ceremonies, mainly from the Gospel of John, when Jesus turns all that water into wine. But remember, that's like a three-day party, right? Yeah. I mean, so yeah. so clearly there are. It, it's a yeah. big ceremony, but back then it was much more of a, a sort of a financial contract between two families, rather than a sort of sign of love. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Who is wealthiest? Right, exactly, and, and, and how, how, how could you get, like, dowry and all that sort of stuff, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, and, and I should say, um, this, this word fornication and sexual immorality, um, it, it has a lot, it's bound up also with the Seventh Commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, so they seem to be sort of playing off one another. But we don't know precisely what Paul means. Okay, so if uh, one of y'all could read uh, verses 1 through 8 of chapter 5. Thanks. It actually reported that there is sexual sin among you. I'm told that a man is living with his father's wife and is having sex with her. Even people who do not know God don't commit that sin, then you are proud. Shouldn't you be filled with sadness instead? Shouldn't you have put the man who did that out of your church? Even though I am not right there with you, I am with you in spirit. I have already judged the one who did that, just as if I were there. When you come together in the name of our Lord Jesus, I will be with you in spirit. The power of our Lord Jesus will also be with you. When you come together like that, hand that man over to Satan. This is his sinful nature will be destroyed. Then his his sinful nature will be destroyed. His spirit will be saved on the day the Lord returns. Your bragging is not good. Okay. It's like yeast. Don't you know that just a little yeast works in the way to the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast. Be like a new batch of dough without yeast. That is what you really are, because Christ has been offered up for us. He is our Passover lamb. Uh, yeah, keep going. Keep going. Oh, hey, yeah. yeah. So let us keep the feast, but not with the old yeast. I'm talking about yeast that is full of hatred and evil. Let us keep the feast with bread made without yeast. Let us do it with bread that is honest and true. Great. Unleavened bread. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I really don't know anything about making bread, um, but it... I think what he's also saying is that in the congregation, um, you know, a bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. You know, like a little bit of bad leaven can can make everything go off the rails. And then it says, then his sinful nature will be destroyed. His spirit will be saved on the day of the Lord return. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it really does seem uh, that Paul's calling on the congregation to discipline this man. Mm -hmm. Sort of, you know, to say, "Hey, look, dude, this is not right. You need, you need to get your act together." And if he does, his spirit will be saved on the day yeah. of the Lord returns. Okay, I mean, verse one, I think is that is hilarious. It is actually reported that there's a sexual immorality among you, and of kind, it's not even found among pagans. For a man is living with his father's wife. I mean, living with, you know, we know what that means. It's like, look, the pagans don't even do that. That's gross, you know. I think, um, so what's happening here um, is that it seems to be that, that Paul has shown up to the Corinthians um, before he wrote this letter, and he said, look, in, in Christ, in baptism, you are a new creation. The old has passed away. You, you are new. You're given this new life. And I think they went too far with that, and they said, oh, great, so that means... I can do whatever the heck I want. And now Paul's saying, no, 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 no. You're free from some of those old things, 
but now you're free to live as uh, Christ lived. So it, it's he's saying, look, you don't now just have sort of license to do whatever you want. Now you have to, it's like baptism, and I would say this, baptism is the starting line, not the finishing line. So that now you've started this new life and you have to live like it. You can't just do it on your own. What's that? Commitment. Yeah, exactly. Commitment. Yeah, discipleship. Commitment. Yeah, no, no, your no, commitment. I harp on mercy and grace all the time. Mercy and grace doesn't mean you're just free to go do right. whatever. It just means that uh, when you know better, you do better. Right, right, right. Is, yeah. Well, I also think we talked about where Corinth was located last week. You've got a lot of different cultures, and we said there were mm -hmm. maybe 40 or 50 people here. Yeah. And we don't know what their right. background right. was. So what to Paul may have looked like awful activities may, in fact, be something that was perfectly acceptable in their home culture. Yeah, and, and, and I think also we think, like, you know, a man and his mother-in-law, there's an age gap there. But you have to remember that, that the, 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 you know, men were marrying women who were much younger so actually, the, the the age difference between the son-in-law and the mother uh, may not have been all that great. It's still weird. It weird. <laughs> it's really hard to see that not through your own <coughs> ideas of what's moral and what's not. Yeah, and even and and yeah, Paul's like, look. <laughs> I just think of the chaos it would create for God's sakes. <laughs> yeah. You, know, you have a lot of cultures, you know, they commit, uh, they um, fix the marriages. And like you're saying, you know, there's usually the woman was the youngest. And yeah. then they would marry her off to somebody that was older. Right. You know, too. Yeah. So, the, but this whole bit about disciplining, kind of a prayer book. And let's open to page 409. And, and you know, churches do have to walk this line that you can't just start kicking people out willy-nilly, but there has to be some sort of sense of discipline. So this is called, as you can see, the disciplinary rubrics. Um, I'll read them. If the priest knows that a person who is living a notoriously evil life intends to come to communion. Okay, that phrase is hilarious. <laughs> notoriously evil life. Uh, the priest shall speak to that person privately and tell him that he may not come to the holy table until he has given clear proof of repentance and amendment of life. The priest shall follow the same procedure with those who have done wrong to their neighbors and are a scandal to other members of the congregation, not allowing such persons to receive communion until they have made restitution for the wrong they have done or at least promised to do so. When the priest sees that there is hatred between members of the congregation, he shall speak privately to each of them, telling them that they may not receive communion until they have <coughs> forgiven each other. And if the person or persons on one side truly forgive the others and desire and promise to make up for their faults, but those on the other side refuse to forgive. The priest shall allow those who are penitent to come to communion, but not those who are stubborn. <laughs> Hilarious. Mm -hmm. In all such cases, the priest is required to notify the bishop within 14 days of the most, giving the reasons for refusing communion. So, I mean, here we are 2,000 years later, and we see this like, oh, cast out this man, you know, discipline him, whatever. Um, I mean, we still sort of have this today. So I'm sure I I've never done this. Um, I but then again I've only been a priest four years. Um, I can see this would be really something if somebody <laughs> did something like this and yeah. they come to the altar rail yeah. anyway. Right. What are you gonna do? Yeah. Okay. So it, it, this is what you do in seminary. Actually, you sort of create these scenarios where this might happen. And, and the church name that you're always serving at is Saint Swithins in the Swamp. So say you're rector of Saint Swithins in the Swamp, and it's a small town, and the mayor of the small town is a member of your congregation, and he is um, taking bribes and having uh, illicit sexual relationships with. You know, whoever and, and the whole town knows it and he's not repentant and you tell him i'm not giving you communion but he still walks up anyway you're like you just kind of pass by him i guess yeah, yeah, yeah. the other is um if you're at st swithin's and your senior warden and your organist are married to two different people but they're having a very open affair with one another and they're not repentant then you don't give yeah. them yeah. That's a little more common. Actually. Right, it's probably much more common, yeah. 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 And it brings to mind what the Pope is doing with all these. Yeah. 
Yeah. Who did he ex excommunicate? The mafia or whatever? Oh yeah. Just recently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was just a yeah. Sicily. Yeah. So there's all sorts of. I mean, you know, we we know there's there's discipline in the church. So that shouldn't shock us. But what do y'all think about these disciplinary rubrics? I just think the wording is. <laughs> I say it's Wonderful. tough on you, but uh, you know, if we if we really stand for what we believe in, mm -hmm. then I think in a larger congregation, it would be almost impossible to have that happen. But I mm -hmm. think in congregations like they had in Corinth, yeah, that would be distinctly yeah. likely. Yeah, yeah, people very mad at each other. Yeah. Tattling on each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no yeah. secrets. Yeah. Um, and somebody asked this morning, like, why do you, why would you wait 14 days to contact your bishop? I said, well, I think this is the time before email. Like, well, you don't write the letter until Monday. You know, the mail doesn't go out until Tuesday. So but, allow a little time for procrastination. Right, exactly. But oh, it does say at most. At most, yeah. Sort of gives you some leeway there. But yeah, um, I mean, but but really, so the church does take this sort of stuff seriously. That mm -hmm. if there is somebody who seems to be sort of immoral, there is um, there is a recourse. Can you bring up immoral? And you brought up ethics, immoral, and and. Morality and ethics, are they one and the same? Yep, doing the right thing. Yeah, would you like your mother to see her name splattered across the paper doing something wrong? That's doing the right thing. Yeah, the immoral. I, but I think immoral but can lead ethics to that also. is more uh, uh, man made yeah. morality. Yeah. I, I don't know that you, I think you can do something that's unethical and it's not necessarily mm -hmm. immoral. Yeah. You know, for an that's, example, I can be helping you figure out how to handle your checking account. Mm -hmm. And it might be unethical for me to make a recommendation to you mm -hmm. that's going to benefit me. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that's really immoral. Yeah. It's unethical. Mm -hmm. that's, right. that's what I was getting at. You yeah, know, I mean, I see. Between the yeah, two. There is a fine. There and, is a fine. I see morality as, like, not good versus evil, but good and evil. Right. And ethics as, as weighing the goods against each other. Yeah. Uh, so ethical questions, you know, classic ethical questions are, you know, like physician-assisted suicide, where there are actually goods on both sides of the table, mm -hmm. and so you have to weigh them out. Morality, to me, is much more about sort of evil and good, mm -hmm. holiness, profanity. Uh, okay, uh, well, somebody read the, the next bit of 1 Corinthians uh, 9 through 13. I wrote a letter to you to tell you to stay away from people who commit sexual sins. I didn't mean that the people of this world who sin that way or who always want more and more. I didn't mean those who cheat or who worship statues of gods. In that case, you would have to leave this world. <laughs> Should I go on? Yeah. But there is what I, uh, but here is what I am writing to you. You must stay away from anyone who claims to be a believer, but who does those things. Stay away from anyone who commits sexual sins or who always wants more and more things. Stay away from a person who worships statues of gods or who tells lies about others. Stay away from anyone who gets drunk or who cheats. Don't even eat with a person like that. Is it my business to judge those outside the church? Aren't you supposed to judge those inside the church? God will judge those outside, Scripture says. Get rid of that evil person. Thank you. So a couple comments. I think it's really interesting just there in verse 9. I wrote to you in my letter. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, so clearly Paul has written to them before. We really wish we had that letter, but we don't. Um, of course, so he's saying, you know, look, this world is full of all sorts of people. You can't really disassociate with them, but it's about in the church, are these people acting that way? And it's interesting to me that our minds, I think, go first to sexually immoral. Like, okay, so who in the church is behaving 
sort of immorally in a, in a sexual manner. Um, and, and we've seen churches, that's all they fight about is who can be in and out depending on sexuality. But to me, it's like, well, the list goes on. Greedy, idolater, reveler, drunkard, robber. We, we've kind of, okay, like greed, I mean, is probably a lot more um, widespread than sexual immorality, right? Yeah. It, so how do, we, how do we actually sort of walk through, how do we use that as a congregation to say, you're really greedy, you need to not be that way. I mean, it's almost, it, it's because it's, we can hide it better, maybe. I, I don't yeah, know. Someone who's being greedy, they can, yeah. they can hide it better. I mean, don't you think, rather yeah, than sort oh, of... Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, maybe, I don't know. But to me, just in, in my sort of short time working in, in, in church in general, we always jump to the sexual question, you know, are you gay? Are you not gay? You know, are you divorced? Do you have an affair? Um, we don't ask like. And that's not only as adults. You know, you hear a lot of that right now with uh, middle school kids. Oh yeah, totally. There's when they get bullied because yeah. you know, like, are you gay? You know, right. you won't date. You know? Right. <laughs> well, but but to me then, like in the church though, we don't ask like. Oh, so are, do you really want a new car? Like, because that seems kind of greedy. You know, it's, it's interesting to me that we get hung up on the sex question. Am I totally off the rails there? No, no, no. Are, um, no, I just think that's true. Well, I also think it's easier to identify someone who's sexually not performing the level you want them to than it is perhaps if I'm secretly greedy, I yeah. can really hide that a whole lot. Yeah. Better. Yeah. Or the lies here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Lies about others. Yeah, in my audits I would have people try to hide their money. Mm -hmm. You know, and not pay their <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's oh I bet. And the other thing was a lot of times they were not only trying to hide it from the IRS, they were trying to hide it from their spouse. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Oh, yeah. I bet. Yeah. Uh, you've probably seen You're a lot. Right. Oof. Very <laughs> I knew a person like that. Um, now, what do y'all think about judgment uh, versus 12 and 13? Ooh, Just sort of curious. Yeah, he's saying that Outside it is my business church. to judge those. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's a question. Mm -hmm. Aren't you supposed to judge those inside the church? Right. That's Versus those outside, inside, mm -hmm. outside. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about that? And then God will judge those outside. Right. He's, saying, he's almost saying, like, don't worry about people outside the church. Like, what just don't, whatever. But inside the church. They go back to having a bad house. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, because I think Paul's concerned, like, that, um, Ooh, nice catch. Um, and I think in today's world, we see ourselves as individuals much more than a community. I think back then, they saw themselves as becoming holy and God's children as a community or not. It wasn't, you know, like me going to church and I'm worshiping Jesus and that's all that matters. I don't care about the person next to me. Um, I think Paul's saying, no, care about the person next to you. Because their their life with Christ is going to impact yours because you're in the same community. And the church I think it was also, the community. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it also, we're talking about expanding missions and going outside the church, found the church mm -hmm. walls. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say you go across the street to the subdivision where I live, mm -hmm. and you say, why don't you come to the church across the street? Mm -hmm. And they say, well, that Linda Berry who lives up there, let me tell you how she is. And I wouldn't go to any church she's at. Oh, right. So to some extent, how people who are yeah. part of your community yeah. behave will affect the effectiveness of your church. Oh, and bad. yeah, uh -huh. absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll try to be nicer, but that's the thought. <laughs> yeah, I'm really worried about that. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but I think we, we, yeah, I mean, so judge... Uh, and I think there are two models for judging. I think our first uh, model of judge is like the criminal judge, right? The guy who like sentences you, he's in the black robe and he says like, you're going to jail for whatever. Mm -hmm. I actually don't think that's the best model for when we read judgment in the New Testament. I think we need to think 
whenever Paul or Jesus or whoever talks about judgment, we need to think of more of the justice of the peace. And that's the person who then takes the, the sort of everything that's happened in the community and tries to weigh um, all the things to make the best possible solution. And so not, so I think when Paul's saying judge the people in the community, I don't think he's saying condemn them. I think he's so saying bring them before you and sort of, and try to sort it all out. Like a consensus. Right. It's an awareness, you know, like mm -hmm. judgment. Like I have always, I find myself, am I, am I judging that person or is it now I'm, I'm aware of the situation and it's more surface. Right. And you know, it's just like, well, I would have known about it if it wasn't brought to my attention in some way. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, this is how I feel about it. It's not a judgment call. Mm -hmm. That's for between you mm -hmm. um, and your personal beliefs, but more so I'm aware of it. And from my personal view now it's, it's on the table. Right. You know, right. and I think that, Am I, I find myself asking, am I judging or am I just aware? Right. You know, so yeah. I mean, I don't think that, it, 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 let's just go, you know, sexual, you know, if you're aware that someone is molesting a child, you know, or has had, molesto, uh, you know, has had encounters with a child, you're not going to ask them to babysit your kid. Okay? Right. Yeah. You're right. Gonna make, yeah. you know, you're going to ask, yeah. you're just going to be like, I'd rather not go over there. Right. And deal with that person. Right. And I'm going to set boundaries up for myself right. and protection and this and that. I'm not judging you. I just have my own little. You're using judgment. I mean, and, and, and that's the hard that's part about this word, right? Because judgment can also mean discretion. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's how I see it when I look at it. It's yeah. Like, yeah. So he's saying use your discretion, you know, like. But then at your, at your discretion, there's it's going to affect the community. It is. Right. I'm yeah, so, like, well, you know, I mean, it's just this, this, and this happened over here. Though that's, you know, it's pretty fact that somebody judged mm -hmm. at one point or another, and this is the label now has been placed on this mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. You know, and because of this, mm -hmm. you know, my children come first, and now I have yeah. to make a judgment call to put their future mm -hmm. and right. and their right. You know, so that's. I mean, I kind of weigh it like in that sense for me right if it yeah. was you know. but then what about those other children that are out there and yeah protected no, your exactly own? yeah and that's why you have to use your your discretion, discretion. To, to, to make sure the right thing is done mm -hmm. and and that's the difference from just saying uh that's an evil person i'm condemning them right and it's like because that's not helpful at all and I think, right because then it goes into gossiping am i gossiping about this person so it's yeah. just like where are you gonna cut the tail right you right. know, a label's a label. The community's yeah. gonna know. Right. You know. Um. You know. So taking off of sort of sexuality, also, I I always use the the axe murder example. <laughs> Say there's an axe murder in the congregation, <laughs> right? Um. Yeah, yes, you call the police, make sure that. But but the the hope is that the congregation could come together to help that person sort of walk through what they're going through and that to me is more of the justice of the peace model like okay what you did was wrong clearly now we've got to work on putting you back together i think that's kind I don't of think that's why people get hung up too like yeah if someone is are you gay or are you not gay because it's like okay well you're broke we gotta fix you you know mm. and it's just like and it's just like well do you go after that and then they are they they a lot of people don't want to touch it because they're like, well, that's going to rub up on me because they don't know enough or this. Is, right. It's such, un, everybody's like, well, it's a, it's a chemical imbalance. It's this, yeah. it's that, and you're, it's so n not concrete. You know, it's not, it, you know, that, well, it says this in the Bible. So for me, it's concrete. Okay. It's just, you know, but for somebody else, it's just like, no, I, was, I feel like this and it's the feeling and it's just, I'm like, I'm not sure. yeah. you know, so it's, a lot of people, I think, for when it comes to sex and stuff like that, they I think they tend to jump on board because sex is supposed to be exciting. Yeah. You know, it's something that from back in the day that it's, you yeah. know, um, you know, up here where lying and doing little things like this is kind of like, it's okay, kind of push it under the rug. But the sex thing has always just been like a big deal. Yeah. You know, you had, oh, what happened? Everybody wants in on it. Right. Everybody wants to know. Everybody yeah. wants to know, you know, whether it's fun or not or what's going on because it's just, um, there's just, it's a lot there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think you're totally right. Okay. We have to get to 1 Corinthians 13, <laughs> which everybody's heard at a wedding before. Um, so, uh, 
you can also see I wrote on the back page also that uh, to me these issues sexual immorality any, uh, these sorts of notorious evils it's really not that these people in the, the Corinthian congregation and us it's not that we don't have love it's that our love is misdirected that our love um, Martin Luther said um, sin is the incurvature of our soul um, and so then true love is curving our soul outwards. And, and I think that's a really kind of a beautiful model. Um, when you think about like, is our soul being curved inward or are we curving outward, outward to God and others? And I think, uh, first Corinthians 13 is about curving outward. So will somebody read this? We've all probably heard it, but I gotta get some water. Somebody, Linda, we, sure. go for it. Sure. Um, <clears throat> If I speak of tongue, with, in tongues of mortals and angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now I see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, then I, I, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, love abide. These three, the greatest of these is love. It does not help if you memorize the King James Version. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so I, I think kind of what was happening here is, is Paul is saying, this is what misdirected love looks like. It's uh, sexual immorality. It's, it's all these different things. And then he says, let me show you what true love looks like. And true love is patient and kind. Um, it's it's more concerned about others. How does that all sound? Does this that's where we go from sense? marriage. Um, beyond marriage is a contract. Yeah. Beyond marriage, right. even. Right. Okay, so we have to get to the chart on the back. Okay, so this is a Gallup poll. Do you believe that in general the following are morally acceptable? So the ones at the top are the most highly acceptable, and the ones at the bottom are the least acceptable. So in any of the ones with an asterisk, um, that shows that it's at a, at a record high among um, the poll. Um, Paul talks about <coughs> Fornication. Yeah. Isn't that what sex between an unmarried man and woman is? Well, so. Yeah, I, I, that's a question. Right, right, right. Well, and, and that's part of the issue is we don't know precisely what Paul means by fornication. Oh. Paul means, it could mean a, a number of different things, uh, including that. Um, yeah. But it could also mean, um, you know, a sexual relationship with animals or, you know, all. It, it could it can mean a number of things. It can mean temple prostitutes. You know, there's there's lots going on. Do you, are any of these surprising? I was surprised by a couple of them. I am surprised that buying and wearing clothing made of animal fur is as high as having a baby out of wedlock. Right. You're like. <laughs> I mean, what? I, I will 58 give you that. I don't think of, it, yeah. but I'm like, wow. 
Yeah. And and maybe this is because I'm an Episcopalian and whatever, but I was like 60, 62, only 62% of people think that gambling is acceptable. Like, so 38% of people are, that was surprising to me. I, I thought that would have been lower down the, or higher up the, the sort of acceptability meter. But then again, maybe a lot of people gamble, but they don't all think it's acceptable. You no, know? that that's not one thing this this poll asks is, well, how many of you actually do any of these things? Yeah, and then you know, I think between about the buying and wearing and having a baby, uh, is that because people believe they are protecting the innocent? Yeah, I don't know. I don't well, know. too, is just like in, in the Bible form that we we're looking at too. It's just like you're saying it was a a trade of stock pretty much you know mm -hmm. like goes oh, so you got five uh, you know this and this and this has this right but in the bible it's okay like they're having babies then mm -hmm. and what today's marriage is and what back then marriages is is completely different right and some people may come back you know if we and it's like, oh what's okay you know you know it was you know she was you know, on the other on the other side it's all like well no we have all these rules and everything like this and, yeah and it's you know, so it's, it depends on time, you know, too. Yep. Now we consider relationships. Right. Right. <laughs> um, and clearly the contentious ones, I mean, doctor says a suicide and abortion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you really expect those to be right there in that, that highly contentious zone. I was really surprised about cloning humans. 13% of people think that, that cloning humans, is, and I, I guess for me, I've never given any thought to the morality <laughs> about cloning humans. The other thing I found interesting about this um, is the uh, married men and women having an affair, only 7% of the population thinks that's morally acceptable. So in a way, I also want to say like, well, the church has done a really good job then of getting that message across <laughs> that, that sort of that fidelity in, 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 uh, in a marriage is of utmost importance, even though we all think divorce is 69% morally acceptable. It, that's a different conversation. Uh, but I was really surprised uh, to see that number. It's kind of scary that that teen, since I have a teenager, that 30%. Mm. So that it's, that it's like that. Yeah. But, but again, this is where I want to sort of actually see what the question is. Because I mean, there's a big difference between uh, in the range of teenage years also. I mean, I'm not sort of trying to be gross or anything. But there's a difference between a college sophomore and a middle schooler. Mm -hmm which are, are both technically teenagers. So I would like to go to Gallup and say, what is that question? How was that question phrased? I, I'm not saying either one is morally acceptable or not, but just sort of saying that seems to be sort of lumping a whole bunch of things well, together. together. Yeah, exactly. Well, how mature you are at 13 versus how mature you are at 18. I mean, that's probably one of the biggest jumps you ever make in your whole life. Right. I mean, you know, yeah. Really. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That frontal little. The, uh, yeah. The death penalty. Mm. I've heard and pretty well some of these things you don't hear and you don't know who to believe. Some people say the death penalty doesn't deter criminals. Mm. Other people say, well, if that person is put to death, they're not going to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So, Protects. Uh, yeah, but it's largely acceptable. Yeah, sixty-one percent of the popul population thinks death penalty is acceptable, which again is weird to me. It's right next to gambling. You're like, I just uh -huh. to me that's uh -huh. like apples and oranges. Like, whoa, death penalty is how do you even put that on the same chart it's as fun. gambling? <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, but I, I just think it's really interesting, um, and, and it gets back, I think, to, to kind of what Paul is saying then, is that uh, churches and, and congregations have to constantly be reassessing what they see 
is, is moral and immoral. And I think a lot of times we just all assume that we all agree on what morality is, but you know, this whole spectrum of people say is that at a holy comforter. And so we have to sort of understand then that, that morality is this sort of, for each of us is a, is a spectrum um, and, and for congregations especially. And so I think a lot of times we assume in a congregation, well, everybody must agree with me about, you know, human clothing or medical testing on animals, but we don't. And, and that's something that we need to figure out as a congregation. Uh, can they use stem cells to clone humans? I don't think so. Can they? they can? I don't think so. I think not, yet. Yeah. not yet. Yeah. Yeah. Not yet. Yeah. Not yet. We don't know. There. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, stem cells, it would seem to me that why doesn't everybody accept that? Because of the fact that it, it can lead to cures for yeah. people. Well, and, and that's where it's an ethical issue, right? I mean, weighing the good uh, one against yeah, another, right? Yeah. Yeah. And to the education of it. Right. You don't know enough about it, you know. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, clearly. Yeah. No, that's true. But now with the, the stem cells, you know, when the babies are born, they preserve those stem cells. Mm. Could those stem cells right. be used to? to I, don't know. I don't know. So I it just my sort of word of warning then I, I think in, in a Christian congregation because that's what the whole sort of thing is about is learning from First Corinthians is that we, we all make sure that when we're talking to somebody in the congregation that we don't assume that their morality is the same as ours. I'm not saying that you shouldn't ask or explore. That's what Christian fellowship is 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 meant to do is to explore these relationships together, um, but not to just sort of blindly assume that everybody agrees with you. Um, but not saying that you shouldn't ask because it's politically incorrect. I think you should ask, but, but that that should lead to sort of mature Christian fellowship and discussion about, about those beliefs. Well, thank you for joining us online. Um, of course you can, um, ask me any questions you want. My email address is jimmy at holycomfortorspring.org. Uh, you can leave questions in the comment bar. Uh, below on YouTube. Uh, thank you for joining us.